Museum. Um, this is uh, Bill Viola's second official uh, visit to the museum, and uh, he has also been featured in two exhibitions here, The Missing Piece um, and uh, also um, uh, Remember That You Will Die, which was another Martin Brown curated exhibition uh, past summer. So they're going to talk about nothing. They'll have something to say about it, so don't worry. Um, and we'll also be interested in what you have to say about what they have to say, so we'll have a question and ask, answer session um, towards the end. But in the meantime, I, for one, uh, am really, really fascinated by the coming together of these two great thinkers and artists. Uh, please welcome Sakshan Panlap Rinpoche and Bill Viola to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> Start what? Um, where do we begin? How can you start a conversation when you have nothing to talk about? <laughs> well, we can uh, think about nothing. Um, hmm. We can talk about the work that we just saw, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to tell you something about it? Yes, please. OK. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say it was really amazing. Oh, thank you. I've seen many on the uh, internet. Mm -hmm. And this piece is really amazing. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Well, it <laughs> <coughs> um, the work um, came out of uh, uh, time, a uh, difficult time for me. Uh, not only were we moving into the 21st century, uh, I think Western people particularly are very concerned about n numbers. They seem to give us some, create some significance in our minds. Um, but more importantly, personally, it came, uh, uh, the piece was, was made uh, um, a year after my father passed away. So uh, I was thinking a lot about death and life. And um, uh, in the second half of my life, I don't even know if I could say half or three quarters or whatever, but uh, just uh, clearly something had changed after I lost him. And, uh, and it was uh, you know, always uh, very difficult. And yet we were moving into a new time, uh, and not just a, another, <coughs> you know, century, but a millennium. So um, I've been working with water for most of my life, and in my images, and um, I wanted to make a work uh, uh, thinking of my dad, but also um, thinking of um, how could I turn um, a death into a birth. And so uh, this is one of five images that are appeared on five large screens in a room. So it's a self-contained room. You walk inside. And in that room, these images appearing of figures underwater. And totally unconsciously, I was making, um, and I didn't realize this until I first showed it, all of the images of the figure falling in the water, drowning, which is how I shot that piece. I ran that piece backwards. And so a drowning becomes a birth. And each of the five images that I created, again, unconsciously, I was turning uh, the image upside down uh, or working with uh, someone coming, um, flying up out of the water after they had dived in. So it's, I was just inverting everything so it would become a kind of positive um, outcome. Mm -hmm. Sounds really beautiful. Mm. I really got quite, uh, I don't know how to say, uh, 
contemplative experience mm -hmm. at the beginning mm -hmm. when I was watching that mm -hmm. because uh, you can't really tell what it is yeah. right at the beginning and you can see how your mind is working yeah. you know we are projecting yeah. uh, oh I'm projecting yeah. right projecting so many things saying oh yeah. looks like a traffic right right this side looks like you know traffic lights mm -hmm. you know the rush hour traffic mm -hmm. movement oh it looks like a waterfall Oh, it looks like bubbles. Mm -hmm. So there was something falling down. Then you can project so many thoughts. Absolutely. Right? Then when you come towards the end, mm -hmm. that you can see with the person, mm. you have to like, ah, oh, it's, mm. you know, so different. Uh, the reality that you're showing is so different from what I've been projecting. Right. Yeah, I think that. That was really amazing. Thank you. I think um, we don't really. Um, understand very well how to see. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the visual image, which I've spent my life working with, um, is in fact very unreliable. And because of this unreliability, um, it gives us an opportunity to, um, to go beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. You know, if you stop at the surface, you <coughs> don't you don't really understand what you're seeing because the <coughs> things that really affect us most deeply are invisible. And, um, and that, that kind of surface image, which we're all attracted to, I think, you know, looking at water, I remember going to my uncle's swimming pool when I was young, um, growing up in New York here, and seeing the beautiful waves, you know, these beautiful waves moving, the colors, you know, and the light coming down. And, and it was like magic. And I wanted to jump in, you know. But then when you jump in and you go beneath the surface, the light and the colors are gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, everything's <coughs> one color, you know. And if you don't breathe, it's going to be permanently one color. <laughs> it's <laughs> called black. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, and I did have an experience when I was young when I almost drowned. So, uh, and that, that, that was very actually important thing to see that idea of the yeah. threshold. And if you go on the other side, it's, it's not what you think at all. Exactly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why we're talking so much. About nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot to nothing. Uh huh. No, there is really. <laughs> I think nothing is is uh, when you lose consciousness. You know, for any. I don't believe that's. I didn't mean to say that's not. That's nothing. But losing consciousness is quite an interesting phenomenon. You know, everyday consciousness. It it really is. Uh, I mean, where are you when you dream? Where are you when you're in the dreamless state? Um, where, who are we at that time? Um, all of those things uh, I have no answers for, and I, I know that you <coughs> have, have very deeply pondered those kinds of <laughs> questions, uh, <laughs> which is certainly why you're laughing. <laughs> because it's actually funny in there. That's like really great. <laughs> I thought it was going to be really dark and, you know, guys with robes and stuff, but it's actually really funny. <laughs> yes. <coughs> yes, I think um, um, what you said earlier about um, the example of the swimming pool, like the colors. And so what you see is nothing like what we actually find behind, right. you know, beneath the, uh, the reality of uh, what we can see. Mm. I think that's really interesting because uh, from the Buddhist perspective, you know, Buddha taught the idea of uh, uh, true reality being emptiness, mm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, emptiness. <coughs> and... Uh, I think emptiness is really very uh, commonly misunderstood hmm. as uh, being something scary, right? quite dark, mm -hmm. and something like uh, 
like losing everything. It's the emptiness is like a loss, right? You know, mm. or emptiness is uh, misunderstood as being a rejection, right? A rejection of uh, something that exists. Uh, but I think you know, actually, the ideal emptiness is acceptance. Mm. Right? It's really acceptance rather than rejection. Mm. Okay, uh, because uh, what we've uh, you know, when we analyze or contemplate more into what we perceive, what we conceive, mm -hmm. and what is the reality or the truth behind, <coughs> when we contemplate deeper, then we begin to accept the reality. You know, uh, reality through some sense of deeper sense of uh, knowledge or uh, analytical mind. Right. You know, and. Uh, No, no, continue, yeah, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, please. <coughs> yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You're a tricky guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What? So <laughs> it's really like, uh, what do you call that? Um, when we analyze and go deeper uh, into reality, uh, we may find something totally different from what we have been projecting or, pre you know, uh, what do you call it, preconceiving? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. exactly. Uh, about the whole reality, you know. Right. And without even knowing what is there behind, mm. uh, sometimes we already reject even before. Exactly. Uh, when we get close to what there is. Right. You know, uh, out of our fear or uh, habit. Right. Uh, and so emptiness has, the, the word emptiness actually carries a kind of negative connotation sometimes uh, for people mm -hmm. uh, of rejection, you know, uh, dark and, mm -hmm. you know, empty mm -hmm. and losing. Yeah. But actually it's, uh, it's accepting, it's richness, it's fullness. Right. And there's a sense of a total freedom there. Right. That's why, like, when you sit in silence, um, uh, the room feels full. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it feels like um, there's um, a, a presence in the room, uh, and and it, it seems to um, activate um, the space, especially when people together sit together mm -hmm. in silence. That's a very very powerful thing. We've all had experiences of that, um, you know, uh, either through meditation. Obviously, is one of the deepest ways uh, to penetrate into that space. But uh, also, I remember young and going to church. And there would be a moment in the service where the priest and uh, Flushing Queens, Father Good, uh, by the name. Uh, <laughs> I like that name. I, well, I might have liked him more if it was Father Bad. That was <laughs> really, like, really cool. But uh, I remember it would always come to this time where you would hear this voice say, and let us pray. And the strange thing about it, when I look back on it, having a lot more experience now, um, is I really didn't know what to do. You know, I think in the West especially, we've lost this idea of the death sense of Sanjuki, of the simple act of closing one's eyes and giving yourself to the silence and to the moment. And, and so I just imagined as a boy sitting in this place, candles lit, and the priest had, has just said, let us pray. We have to be like absolutely silent. I kind of felt that a lot of the people around me, the, the grown-ups were like, you know, thinking about you know, what they had to do, <laughs> you know, when they got out of church and, and you know, how if they balance their checkbook okay and, you know, and there's all this kind of activity going on, um, <coughs> which uh, we in the West really, uh, it's been so long, it's really been since the Middle Ages that we really learned uh, and practiced true meditation, you know, mm -hmm. true, the true depth right. of, of the experience. And, it, and as the mind got more complex through enlightenment <coughs> and so on, it became harder to actually just uh, still the mind, you know, and really just feel the essence um, within. And that, that I think is still with us today. In fact, it's even exacerbated and amplified by technology and by our, our fast lifestyles now. So we kind of crave silence and stillness, <coughs> but we're not really <coughs> given the opportunity except through these formal uh, institutions to practice it. That's right. Mm. And so I think um, I guess I'm experiencing the same thing in Seattle. Huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
left left hand. He has to be. Yeah. Absolutely. Left left hand piano. So <laughs> 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 That's good. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I think um, from the Buddhist point of view, um, it's really interesting because the reality that what the Buddha taught is. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's the same or exactly the same or not, but there's some progression uh, of the development of, uh, of uh, discovering the truth or reality in meditative tradition mm -hmm. here, which is uh, kind of in some ways similar to uh, our you know, Western science, mm. Western science. Mm. Like uh, at the beginning, there was the atomic science, uh, where the beliefs that you know finest particles mm -hmm. in the atom at atomic level existed in that like the absolute mm -hmm. right. you know. uh, and then later now uh, we say such particles do not exist right right so it's more now we're talking about uh, the quantum physics right and different things here you know where we're talking about quarks right. Right. What, what really truly exists at the end is the quark, and I have a, a you know, chemist uh, who is my friend in upstate New York, <coughs> and says when I ask my friend, they say that uh, the quark you cannot divide the quark. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a quark has two things: up quark and down quark. <laughs> That's what they call That's it. Right. I think up quark yeah. and down quark. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> Please don't. <coughs> misunderstand that uh, I don't know anything about uh, science or physics, but oh, I know a little bit here and there. So they say there's an up quark and down quark in one quark. And when you try to separate that one quark into pieces, mm -hmm. it's very difficult, mm -hmm. but you can. But when you split that a piece of quark, I don't know what you call piece. <laughs> I, don't <laughs> I don't even know the word. Uh, when you when you separate that, yeah. then it develops into another two uh, quarks, uh -huh. but each one will have up quark and down quark, huh? but those two you cannot separate. Really? Yeah. Huh. That's what I found out <laughs> from my friend. You know. I don't know anything. I didn't uh, know that. If it's true or not, I don't hmm. know. Does it um, keep multiplying like that? Is that possible? Yeah, you can you can divide like that, I guess. It you know. But you divide it, but it doesn't separate. It keeps up and down quark cannot be separated. I see. You know, it's like some friends of mine in physics. Can't <laughs> be separated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say, like you or unlike you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. But oh. anyway, <laughs> what I was thinking about is uh, it's really similar to what the Buddhist teaching, you know, Buddhist uh, view, mm -hmm. talk about like how we cannot separate. Appearance from emptiness, uh -huh. right? You know what right. they appear, uh, and what is really the true reality or nature. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. you could say that's like up and down quark, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So appearance and emptiness, right. light and dark, right? right? Yeah. You can really separate that. Mm -hmm. so appearance, emptiness, you cannot be separated. Right. And that's why we that's say. That's very beautiful. So it's actually it's really like a mm. very similar here. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the Buddhist uh, philosophy and meditative uh, tradition, mm. also we talk about the atomic existence at the beginning, Buddha right. taught. And then second level, saying, oh, not only that, it doesn't mm. really exist. And then emptiness. And then at the end, it's not just empty, but it's like appearance emptiness, mm. inseparable. It, you mean it's the same thing? It's the same thing. The emptiness and really, yeah. That's why in this uh, Kama Sutra, like mm -hmm. called the Par Prajnaparamita Sutra, mm -hmm. uh, transcendental knowledge sutra, discourse on transcendental knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, Buddha taught, and he said, form is emptiness, emptiness is also form, mm -hmm. right? Form is exactly. no other than emptiness, right. emptiness yeah. is no other than form, right? You know, so. Well, I remember, and the first time I remember encountering uh, emptiness, I guess, uh -huh. was when I was in art school, actually, mm -hmm. taking art. I'd taken art classes 
most of my life when I was young. Um, and uh, I was, um, I remember the first time we learned about what uh, we call negative space. Negative space, that's yeah. right. And, and, and I learned about this not through physics or, or things like that, but through uh, you know, being in school and, and having to make drawings. And, and the teacher, I remember, was you know, admonishing me because I didn't have enough negative space in my drawings. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so, uh, uh, but it was really a beautiful thing because it was, it was uh, tying together mm -hmm. the uh, emptiness and the actual object, the actual s strokes, the marks you make on the paper. You know, and, and human marks are so ancient. You know, I remember being in the Museum of Man in, in, in Paris, and I went through this exhibit of uh, fossils and different things and ge geographic, you know, objects and these rocks, and, and it was, they were sort of re re retracing the steps of human, you know, evolution and development, and there was a, a there were these animal bones, and then you came to the next display, and it was uh, a animal bone. I think it was a reindeer antler, and on that antler, it had three marks. Just that's it. And as soon as I saw that reindeer antler, I knew that a person was there. Mm. That someone had made those marks, you know, <coughs> 130,000 years ago. And it was just astonishing, you know, that the human presence uh, not only has been existing that long, but the fact that when we make a mark, when we utter something, when we, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, come up with an idea, when we have a child, uh, when we experience the loss of a loved one, you know, each of those are like marks that are made. They leave a kind of impression in the world, and um, that feeling of this was not just some stone, this wasn't just some even you know bone of an animal, but it was actually a person made the mark as if to say, I exist, that I'm here, mm -hmm. you know, that I saw this. Uh, and that's really what art is. Art comes out of these caves where people had to go away from the world, isolate <coughs> themselves, to have had to completely um, purify themselves, actually. Uh, and, and these were the, the shaman, which shaman is the oldest religion on the planet. And these people, when the hunts were coming up, would go uh, into the caves to purify themselves. Uh, these are the first rituals we know of. And uh, a lot of them also centered around the worship of the bear in the cave, most dangerous animal. And they would go in there and they would um, have the blessing of the group, uh, which is really important. And this is the this is the the blessing of the what? The blessing of the group, the oh entire God. group they were with. Um, this is really the prototype for art making to this day, uh, and that is that most of the people have to go out on the hunt mm -hmm. to preserve the group and keep care of it. But certain people who have special powers and connections to the unseen world, remain behind. And of course, you have to pay their expenses, <laughs> right? <laughs> so they actually are uh, allowed to not work, go out and hunt bison, but what do they do? They paint the bison on the wall of the cave, places like Lascaux mm -hmm. and Trois Trois in south of France, and they, they make these images, these these icons of these living creatures, and they ensure that the hunt will be successful that way. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do as artists. That's a very important thing that we do. We need to go into some other place, some protected place. We call it a studio today, but it's had many names. <laughs> and and we, we need to stay there long enough for this inspiration to become something real. Yeah. You know, and that's that's a very special thing. So. When I first encountered Tibetan Buddhism, it was on a trip to Ladakh with my wife, Kira. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking through these little towns and villages uh, and seeing some of the monks coming down. And uh, it, was, it was a time when the, the harvest was on and they were getting the food and 
you know, and, and then you see these, these incredible monasteries on the hills, and I, I saw for the first time the connection between that, like uh, people are all working in the field, like my story in prehistoric times, they're working in the field, mm -hmm. and then up in the hill, there's this special place which is, is, is its, own, its own world, but is absolutely necessary, absolutely necessary to have the teaching, to know that someone's praying for you when you're feeding your family, you know, with your work and with, with your actions. And I thought that was a very profound thing, and it, it still exists today. You know, it's a businessman going off to work, and, you know, the families are, you know, taken care of. It's a very basically <coughs> fundamental human thing. That's really interesting. Um, about the art, uh, when you talk about a negative space, yeah. the negative space is really interesting. I, mm. I also learned that uh, the graphic design. Yeah, you're an artist, right? You make work. Uh, yeah, some people call me artist. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can yeah. I call you an artist? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. You're an artist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other artists in the room? We can know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm an artist who talks about nothing. Right. That's right. the best kind. Yeah. <coughs> no, but you do, you do, do uh, creative work. I do a little bit, yeah. yeah. And I love painting and uh, mm. uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, negative space is really interesting. Yeah. Because, like, if there's no space, you can't create anything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Like, no matter, like, how strong the man is, yeah. or no matter how good of an idea you may have, mm -hmm. uh, if there's no space, you can't create anything. Mm -hmm. If there's no space, a globe can't exist. Space is the ground for everything, right. and from space, all creativity uh, makes happiness. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and from space, everything arises, and everything mm -hmm. resolves into space. Mm -hmm. Like at the end, like you know, our planet may also dissolve into space. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, space is the basis for all arising, all ceasing, mm -hmm. and so. That space is what we call emptiness. Interesting. And um, this emptiness is present at all times. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it's interesting because uh, uh, you talk about agree with Einstein a little bit here mm -hmm. that time and space are relative. Mm -hmm. You know, <coughs> uh, there's a sense of continuity and uh, alterativeness, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it is uh, still a relative. No uh, concepts and no perceptions can really measure the depth of space and you know, the reality. Right. I think uh, what my encounters with space, um, I remember being in uh, Durham Cathedral in Northeast England. It's an extremely beautiful uh, Norman church, and it's absolutely, it's incredibly. Uh, portion, mm -hmm. and you feel you feel it. Um, I think people have a very special antenna for space. You know, <laughs> they know, uh, and we all know, even unconsciously, when things are disharmonious. You know, um, that we feel when something isn't in balance. We go in a restaurant, we go in a store, we go in uh, someone's house, and you feel right away when it's not. Um, um, uh, complete, you know, that the parts are e being different just hold themselves in a, in a very uh, profound and beautiful way. And, and you know when that's off. And what, what also happens with sound, you, you go to a place. Um, I was, uh, one of the projects I, I did was at the Venice Biennale in 1995. And Kira and I uh, were there uh, setting up this, this piece. And um, we, we were really trying to, um, had a problem because I had five works in this exhibition and um, the works were all continuous series of rooms and we had to, uh, and each piece had sound and so we had to actually um, figure out how can we get all these people to be walking through this pavilion, th through all the, the five rooms. Um, but having to open doors and the sound would come out. So um, for the first time, we hired an a, a acoustic engineer 
These people are absolutely amazing. Their knowledge of space is, is extraordinary. And so we started working with this guy, and in the course of the conversation, as he came to the studio multiple times, we're planning what to do, he explained the problem. Uh, and he designed a really beautiful system with these doors that um, closed, and they were double doors. And what all, all he did was he just made a little notch in the edge of the door. So instead of when the door closes, instead of having the edge of the door be straight, it was an angle, like a little angle like that. And that interlocked when the door closed, and it completely sealed out the sound. Oh. And he said, you just need the tiniest, like you need a millimeter, two millimeters of, 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 uh, uh, you know, of the material there. And, and the opposite one on the other side, you know, it's like opposites cancel, and you can pretty much completely isolate two rooms um, acoustically. Then he also said that, um, which I haven't really tried yet, <laughs> was a great idea, but he said, he said, I could make uh, a room, I could take any room, I could put some acoustic material around, and if you walk in this room and you sit down with a friend and you have a nice conversation like we're doing, uh, he said, I can guarantee that within five minutes you will want to leave the room. You will what? You want to leave the room oh. within five minutes because something is disharmonious. Something is not right. And you can't analyze it. You don't know what it is. You just have a feeling that you don't want to be there. Mm. And of course, this government has used that to terrific uh, advantage, disadvantage in its, uh, its fight against so-called terrorism, <laughs> um, they, they do use a lot of, they use sound as a weapon today in this country. I, I find that the most disturbing thing, you know, to think of Mozart and all these incredible people, you know, that we have our own government doing to people with sound uh, is, is pretty unconscionable. But um, sound is, is, as we know in, in Hindu culture, is, uh, is uh, you know, the origin, everything comes from space. Mm -hmm. Everything arises from space. <coughs> That's right. We have this. Uh, uh, we share the same between Hinduism and Buddhism about the mantra. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Sound. Mm -hmm. uh, primordial sound. Mm -hmm. And the power of uh, uh, certain syllables and sounds right. in the mantra. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like, so yeah. what you have been uh, doing. Yeah. Right. How you can make a person leave in five minutes. Right. So if that's possible, then there could be some sound that can make your mind more awake. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like the sound of a bell or a gong. Mm -hmm. if you will. That's right. Yeah. So the mantra makes a lot more sense now. Can you talk a little? <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> really. Helpful. I'll call him up right yeah. away. Okay. Yeah. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit, Rinpoche, about about sound, the the primordial sound, and and how that uh, how that it works in Buddhism? I find that fascinating. I've never really understood it completely. Because I think, uh, generally speaking, like uh, sound and music, mm -hmm. especially like the melody mm -hmm. and the music, uh, and like chanting, uh, brings our consciousness, our mind, to a very different state. Right on the spot, right. naturally. You know, it doesn't have to be mantra. It doesn't have to be sacred word, mm -hmm. but anything. Like you know, even if you listen to Rolling Stone, <laughs> right? Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, your mind comes to a different state when you listen to music. Yes, that's true. Right? Music. Absolutely. You know, any kind of mm -hmm. music. You know. Sure. Uh, Rolling Stones. Uh, uh, that's what I listen. To. So <coughs> you can feel in the power of sound and music mm. and melody. Chanting. Uh, <laughs> the power. Of that was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> time. Okay. Yeah. Time to meditate. Quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know we have this thing that sound uh, connects our mind. Oh, our work. You know, our brain works differently. Mm -hmm. right? Different parts of the brain work different mm -hmm. things, and sound is a different thing. And also, I heard that uh, I was staying in a friend's home in London. Dear friend died of Alzheimer's, and uh, he was saying that in the last days of Alzheimer's disease, he could not recognize anyone, right? Can't uh, really remember anything, but 
they both can sit together and sing as Harrison songs. They can remember from beginning to end. Huh. All the songs. Yeah. You know, Celtic songs. Yeah. They can sing together. Yeah. No problem. Wow. And so it's really very interesting how it works with your brain. Mm -hmm. um, and when you sing, you can connect with different nature, mm -hmm. uh, deeper nature, especially mm -hmm. when you have these mantras and these mantras, mm -hmm. uh, which we call actually the sound of Dharmata. So do you think it actually, it probably just changes the brain in some ways, the brain waves or something like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, technically I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It directs our brain in different ways. Yeah. Like uh, every sound, like uh, when we hear the sound, uh, you know, I've been reading this book, uh, from the Hindu teacher Muktananda, mm -hmm. uh, Baba Muktananda, because I've uh, I've met him when I was ten. Mm -hmm. and then when you were ten? Yeah, when I was ten years old. Mm -hmm. I met him in India, and then I met him later in upstate New York when I was fourteen. Mm -hmm. My my group, my teacher, and we had a very wonderful connection. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was reading his book uh, in the last few years, and he was talking about mantra, the power of mantra. And he said he was giving this talk about the power of the sound, of the mantra, reciting mantras. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, one student like spoke to him, and he said, like, how, how does the mantra work? Uh, because if you keep saying, like, you know, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I want food, I want food, you know, if you recite that 100,000 times, you will still be hungry, <laughs> right? <laughs> you won't be full. Right. So how does this mantra work? Like, you know, right. I want to get enlightened, I want to get enlightened, or something like that. Right. The mantras. And, and then he said, uh, the guru said, you know, he used the F word. Which, oh, uh, okay. I guess uh, we, we don't need to do here because we talk no. about nothing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so he used the F word and mm. say, you know, shut the thing up. Right. Right. And sit down. And then he said, the student sat down, and then the guru continued his <laughs> discussion about uh, the mantra. And then, uh, then the, the student keep raising his hand again and again. Mm -hmm. And then the teacher totally ignored him, and then suddenly the student stood up and shouted at the teacher, saying, how can you do that? Yeah. And he said, how can you do what? And use this F word. And then teacher said, see, the power of <laughs> yeah. Just a little sound, right? right. The, the F sound right. makes you so angry. Yeah. Right? The power of the sound. Yeah. How um, it changes your mind. And we yeah. can see, you know, how it changes our mind in everyday life. Mm -hmm. uh, not even sound, even with science. Like we have so many American hand mudras. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, American hand mudras we use when we drive. Right. Um, <laughs> But you know, on the West Coast uh, freeway. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so we can see the power of uh, sign, for mm -hmm. symbol, right. you know, sound. Right. And uh, it is the same as the power of our concept. Mm -hmm. And the sound is translated into concept, right. Right, the word that we hear, and we translate it into thought process. Right. And then the thought process, our concept becomes so powerful that we start believing in something that isn't really true. Right. Right. And uh, we always talk about religious persons being, uh, uh, having what you call blind faith. Mm -hmm. But uh, I sometimes think that we as an ordinary person, we have stronger blind faith than the religious people. Hmm. Right. We blindly believe these things exist. We have very strong blind faith about believing in our concept right. and things that people tell you, right. like things that you know, uh, uh, parents, the teachers, the government, mm -hmm. uh, whoever is telling us as the CNN. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, this is this is really. Um, I think now we're getting right into my incredible dilemma in the work that I do primarily because of the medium that I use. 
um, I think the medium that I use, digital images, uh, are responsible for untold suffering in the world. They're responsible for misinformation, for uh, blatant lies. Um, uh, it's, it's a very, very serious uh, situation we've got ourselves in. Our minds today are so distracted. Thank you. Uh, and um, it's something that I think about every day when I push the little button in my camera and the little light goes on and it starts to take an image. You know, right now, in this talk, if I had my video camera with me, I could turn that camera on and I could spin up the lights and take a shot of all these beautiful faces I see looking at me from the darkness. And I would go home and I'd show that to my friends and we'd, How about me? we'd discuss. Well, you know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think the, the clothes are a little too bright. I, I think know, it's just, yeah, we got to take that down. Yeah, a little you bit. totally ignored me. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. Um, you, laughter, I think, is the antidote to many, many things. So, but um, uh, so that, that uh, tape I could show. Now, if I take that camera and I point it over there in the corner, not only do we not exist, but you don't exist either. And I could bring that tape back and no one would ever know that you even existed. That's why the camera is one of the most dangerous instruments on the planet. Second most dangerous instrument on the planet is this little finger there. I see this one, that muscle right there. That's your camera, okay? So with this one little finger, I can uh, push a button that can make a family destitute take all their money, I could foreclose on their home. <laughs> I could uh, start a nuclear war by nuking St. Petersburg. Some guy in a missile silo, right now there are guys in missile silos up in the northern part of America that could do that. Uh, you know, I could pull a trigger on a sniper scope and end someone's life. Uh, you know, does the I button says the enlightenment? <laughs> yeah, the, well the enlightenment button is definitely, we got to talk to Steve Jobs immediately. He's got to put those on every computer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Because, well, it's interesting because when uh, Kira and I actually had a great experience um, uh, in 2005, we uh, visited uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala, mm -hmm. and we were doing, uh, asked to do, uh, participate in a big art exhibition for uh, the purpose of helping the Tibetan refugees and we had never been uh, to Dharamsala and, um, and we had never met His Holiness. So we thought that would be a great thing. And we have two, at, the, at that time our boys were a little younger, this was five years ago, uh, but they were, they were teenagers, uh, approaching teenagehood in the case of our younger one. And uh, so we took them on this trip and we all went there and it was this, this long, amazing journey. I mean, it took like two days and trains and jeeps and things and we finally got there. And then we went to, um, to visit him and uh, it was probably, obviously, I think anybody would agree it was probably the most am amazing experience of our lives and it stayed with us tremendously. And I was asking him uh, on that trip um, of seeing uh, who the people are that we're gonna be donating these works to and, uh, and spending a lovely time. And at, at when we had our audience with him, I asked him, uh, all of our, our two boys were asked to, you know, say something to His Holiness and, and ask questions and my wife Kira did and, and then I was, uh, you know, left and I was kind of going and started to talk and I was saying, you know, her, Your Holiness, that's what I said before, I said I'm very concerned about the medium that I work with, it's responsible for all this, this really bad information and it's distracting everybody and, and, uh, and I said, you know, my father when we go on these trips, uh, uh, you know, to Monument Valley and took my mom and dad later in their life on these trips, my dad would go in the motel room, turn on the TV and walk away. <laughs> and His Holiness looked me right in the eye and said, I do that too. You know, where was the words of wisdom I was waiting for? And of course I didn't realize, I was too stupid to realize that those were the words of wisdom, right. Bill. Hello. <laughs> so it was just so beautiful, you know. I do that too, but I never forgot that. Oh, that's really neat. Now it's okay to watch Beautiful TV. Beautiful story. <laughs> <laughs> anyway.
You chose in the moment? Chose in the moment? Push the forefinger on the button to allow um, a conversation oh. to be expanded to okay. um, the whole room. <laughs> okay. Um, so if we could have the house lights up, please. Um, so this is now your chance, of course, to enter the discussion on nothingness. And we've got microphones on either side of the house. Now, we've got a very full room today. Um, so what we'd like to do is, um, if you've got a question you want to ask and make it brief, just raise your hand and we'll get the microphone to you. And we'll try to take two people at a time in the sense that we'll get the microphones to two people um, in, in, in session. So we've got... A question here, do there we have a second? Do we have a s oh, really? Okay, all right, Cindy, then I'll use that mic same microphone. And okay, thank you. Pass a few mics all right, sir. Uh, this is a question about form and emptiness. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. And yet we distinguish them. We distinguish them. And on what basis do we distinguish them if form is emptiness? and emptiness is form. On what basis do we distinguish them? And is the distinction real? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, after you, sir. No. <laughs> no, <just kidding. laughs> um, yeah, actually, well, we didn't have uh, much time to talk about emptiness, but uh, <laughs> in general speaking, um, that distinction is false, you know, false distinction. And that distinction is based on our habitual tendency of uh, uh, duality, right? Uh, we always see things in dual. Uh, we always see things in contrast. Good and evil, appearance and emptiness, you know, all these things. And so uh, the, the distinction or the separation comes from our habitual tendency. And so I was thinking actually, when Bill was talking here uh, earlier, I was thinking about your presentation here and also the things that I watched on YouTube. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, I was thinking, like, can we really perceive something without any concept. <coughs> so when we do uh, perceive something without any label or concept, in that moment, there is no distinction between emptiness or appearance. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Two, two brief questions, please. Uh, one, just Definition, is nothingness and emptiness the same thing? Because I know we talk a lot about nothing and you've spoken all the time about emptiness. I just want to know that. Mm. And secondly, for Mr. Viola, um, the old world, or maybe all the work that you've done that was based on, on biblical themes and on uh, more Christian themes, that, did that contain also for you the same type of nothingness or emptiness that, you're talk that, that you've talked about? Or did, did you consider that very different in, along with those parameters? So just two questions, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, well, um, <coughs> the, uh, first of all, the work I did on Christian themes was um, the, the work um, that came out of that Five Angels piece and had to do with my father's passion. And, um, and, and it wasn't really work on Christian themes per se. I was really interested in tears. Um, and um, because I found as someone who likes to think I know what I'm doing and I'm in control, uh, and, and that's how I make my art, um, although I would say it comes from a place that I can't really know and comprehend myself, and that's fine. But uh, in the case of, of just getting to um, this point of uh, you know, thinking about Christian things per se, no. I, I think right now, especially more than ever, we need to really think about the idea of universal spirituality. I mean, everybody's born with an essence within them. And it's no matter what religion it is, we all have our different religions, our different ways of worshiping, but the, but the object of the worship is the same. And emptiness is one word for that object. But, um, uh, 
And I think that's a real important thing at this particular moment in human history where we're facing all these crises at the same time, ecological crises, spiritual crises. People aren't going to, to church. They're not even worshiping at all, especially in this country. You know, we have um, had banking crises. I mean, it's really, this is, this is a unique time, and I think it's a time of great opportunity. And it's a time more than ever, I truly believe, that we need art. Um, we need art which comes right out from the human soul. We need those kinds of images. We need that kind of work. So, so that was my way of helping myself through this <coughs> experience, and it came through the tears because I think tears are the purest form of human expression. Why? Because you hurt your finger and you cry. You see a beautiful sunset and you cry. You see someone who's dying and you cry. You see a baby who's being born and you cry. And tears are so profound in, in such a, a deep way. Uh, and they come up in all traditions, this idea of crying, communal crying, private crying. So that was something I was just trying to understand in my own life. And of course, whenever we think we understand something, we should share it. You know, that's, that's the most important thing. I mean, every single one of us in this room is here because someone in our past gave us a helping hand. Someone helped us to pick up these cups and drink those or to spill on your shirt when you're little or <coughs> write a great text or <coughs> give you an idea. People inspire, we're here for inspiration of each other in the age where concepts and ideas become economically valued. You know, This is a huge distortion of the human project, which is to, to increase knowledge. And when we increase knowledge, what we're doing is actually just the beginning point. And, you know, oh, we have all these institutions here through knowledge. That's great. But the real truth underneath it that keeps the whole system going is mystery. You know, the mystery, you can have all the books in the world in your library, that's fantastic. But the thing that's going to make you go, go deeper and, and more is the mystery, the thing you don't know. That's how love works. Two people come together. It's fun at the beginning. It's all visual. They look, this one looks <laughs> pretty. Wow, cool. <laughs> But in reality, if that love's going to last, there has to be that emptiness in each person that mm -hmm. you don't know. There's an unknown in each and every one of us. That's the most <coughs> precious thing we have. Um, nothingness and emptiness. Um, you could say they're about the same, anyway, yeah, to make it easy. <laughs> I mean, easy for me. Uh, uh, but actually, <coughs> from the, the Buddhist, you know, contemplative uh, philosophy point of view, uh, there's some slight distinction between the two. <coughs> you know, uh, emptiness actually means wholeness. Hmm. You know, it's not just uh, nothing. You know, so there's some differences here. And emptiness is uh, full of uh, energy, right? There's a brilliant spark uh, in the space. And the space is full of, uh, uh, everything in space is fullness. So it's not just like you know, nothingness or the, or the vacuum. You know? So there's a slight difference uh, in that sense. That's some really great questions. Um, any more? Okay, we have uh, one over in the third row, a um, gentleman I can <laughs> distinguish as the founder of this museum, Donald Rubin. Oh, wow. um, and uh, I, I was intrigued by, by the question of emptiness, and so many people in our society, as a result of accidents, MS, you know, mental memory loss, Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. are living very empty lives mm -hmm. in, in, in the dark, by themselves, at homes and hospitals. There are millions and millions of people. Mm -hmm. And we're working on a project that I would like to share with you, not the museum, but through our foundation. We're using music. Oh. And we're using music, we call the project Music and Memory. Uh -huh. We ask the families of the patients what music did they like before they lost their memory? And then we brought, uh, the, the experiment started about a year and a half ago with a big nursing home in Long Island. We bought 200 Apple iPods for about 50 or $60 each. 
and had a volunteer work with the nurses and the staff to ask the families of the patients what music did they like before they lost the memory. And that's the whole key. It might be Billie Holiday, but there was a guy in the military who liked marching music. Somebody liked, <laughs> somebody liked something else. And so everybody in this room has their, and we just took on 10 to 20 minutes uh -huh. of the music and had aides and the nurses uh, program the music for the people. And we have, we're doing a 50 minute video, hopefully it's gonna be for public television. We don't know about it yet, but that's the, the aim of it. Oh, that's but right we're, work, we're working with one of their biggest producers to, to uh, do this. And the people are coming back to life. They're not talking like you and I, mm. but they're taking care of themselves. They're getting up and dancing. Mm. And it's something that every one of you in this room who have relatives in nursing homes or mm -hmm. home uh, can just uh, duplicate. And the Institute of Music and Memory uh, uh, had an event where we were honored a couple of months ago mm -hmm. for this program because they sort of, they're adopting it with us as a result of us bringing it to their attention. But it's very simple. So the minds of people that seem like they had an accident or MS or a stroke uh, is not totally lost. And they're not talking, they're not having a rational conversation mostly, mm -hmm. but they're taking care of themselves, they're going to the bathroom themselves, they're not wow. throwing food at each other and they're yeah. not screaming. So there is something that using simple music, simple music gives the, the empty mind <laughs> uh, fullness. Right. That's right, that's lovely, that's a terrific thing, it's really yeah. great. Yeah, we explore these issues um, every spring in a series called Brainwave, where we put neuroscientists together with other people and uh, work out what's happening in our brains. And um, Bill, I, I really liked what you said or questioned about w who are we when we dream? Mm -hmm. And the whole th um, theme of next spring is going to be um, dreaming mm -hmm. and its um, use, of course, um, in yep. Buddhism, yep. in various forms of it. Um, and also, I mean, universally, um, what dreams signify and why, why we do it. Um, but that's for next spring. Meanwhile, back to <laughs> nothing. Um, any more hands in the audience? Yes, we've got one here in the third row. And anybody else on this side? Yes, um, keep <coughs> your hand up, ma'am, so we can see you. Thank you so much. Um, getting so much out of this. And I'm curious about in your work, in the medium you work in, there's also a wonderful reflection or echoing of this sort of form and emptiness and the perceived duality where it's such a vis visceral experience and the, and the materiality of the water, the form, the human forms, when mm -hmm. actually it's ephemeral, digital, the video of the digital doesn't exist in terms of material form. Mm -hmm. And I also connect that working with digital tools, whether it's a camera or a computer, can be a very disembodied experience. Mm -hmm. So as soon as my finger starts pressing a button, I lose my body completely. And I'm curious about your, your experience of materiality and physicality and your mm. body mm -hmm. in your process of creation. Well, if, that, if that's happening to you, then um, you have to change that. Um, you must keep your body together with your mind. Um, that's a very important thing, especially today in this disembodied world of distant voices and all these, um, uh, you know, these long distance uh, kind of levels of communication and social networking and everything. You know, um, the two dogs, if you've ever seen that New Yorker cartoon, the two dogs sitting at the computer and one, the older dog's teaching the younger dog how to get on the computer and go online and stuff. And he says, and the really great thing about the internet is they don't even know you're a dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we <laughs> we have to keep a sense of ourselves, and we have to. And, and I think the the, the tragedy in the West uh, since uh, you know 17th, 16th century with Mr. Descartes is the separation of body and mind. That's a disaster that we're still suffering from. And this media tends to exacerbate that and amplify that and takes you away from embodiment, which is the only chance we have on 
human existence right now, you know, to make things better. Um, so including body and mind in, in what we do, you should be really focusing on that um, in your work. For myself personally, it, it just, it was my childhood drowning experience where I almost died underwater in New York State when I was six years old. And I saw the most beautiful image I've ever seen in my life. I saw shafts of light, very much like the first thing you saw tonight. And, and that's where it all comes from. And, and I should be dead, but my uncle came in and pulled me out. And I didn't even know I was drowning. And I was in a beautiful place that looked like paradise and I wanted to return there and I guess most of my work in my entire life was about getting back to that <laughs> moment of true peace. So one of the only moments of true peace I had in my life was when I was on the bottom of a lake. And um, so, so that kind of, um, you know, you, you take this medium, the video medium, um, it is a kind of water. The electronic circuits in all plasma streams and any kind of video stream are, are actually described by physicists in terms of flowing water. There's, there's you know, that's how the electrical circuits are just like plumbing, basically. Uh, they use the same uh, kind of metaphor for water to um, make that analogy and connection. The other thing that happens when you watch these screens uh, is, and you should do everything mindfully when you watch, you know, to understand what you're looking at. You know, we used to tell our young kids when they were little, we used to play a game. When the commercials came, we were watching TV, we'd say, what are they selling? It was the what are they selling game. And so my boys learned to sort of look through the facade <coughs> and see what's really going on. And it was really interesting for them. But the thing about this medium, why it's so similar to us, is because right now in this discussion, Impreche and I and all of you have little electronic sparks, back in, sparks jumping back and forth in our neurons, <laughs> uh, you know, at the speed of light, okay? And, and those, those sparks are the same sparks, the same material, in uh, a video screen. Um, the night light in your bathroom runs on about six watts of power, you know? And that runs the entire mind, basically. Uh, and and so, so that kind of idea of the energy that's there is when you push your, turn your video screen on, just go up to it sometime and touch it. Even the, even the new one, there's a little bit of heat there, okay? You turn it off at the end of the night, you're ready for bed, you push that off button, it goes silence, darkness. Touch it five minutes later, and it's cold. Just like us. You know, we're born, we're warm. We die, we're cold. So it has, it has an almost humanism built into it, into these machines. And it's up to us to take the human part of it and really emphasize that against all these other things that are coming at us. And want our money and want our beliefs and want to deceive us. And, you know. So it's a very, very important thing to know where you are in time and space, you know, especially at this period of history. Rinpoche, before we ask um, the next question, um, as a painter, and you, you, you practice calligraphy, don't you? Yeah. As well? yeah. I so w w what's your relationship to um, the tool that you wield in order to make mm. the impression that you want to make, and how does that connection happen for you? Does it happen the same way as it happens for Bill? Um, that's a fun game. <laughs> I just like to play it. <laughs> you know, uh, with my uh, brush, the ink, the paper, the vinegar, try to make the space. Mm. Uh, and it's more of a, I don't know how to say. Uh, more like relaxing, you know, relaxing your mind. You know. uh, more, if I have a relaxing mind, empty, or I don't know, spacious, right? Spacious and open mind. Mm. Uh, I enjoy more, and the result seems to be nicer. You know, people seem to like what I did. Uh, when I'm more like, you know, focused, strapped, you know, wanting to create something. Or having the need to create something, nothing happens. Okay. I can do something, you know, type of thing, but uh, no one really enjoys that. You know. So it's more like a connection is more of a sense of a open, spacious mind mm. and a relaxation and playing. You know. uh, playing in the field of uh, openness, spaciousness, uh, the empty space. With the 
life is for awareness, for breath of awareness. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just a pleasure. We had a question with Fitra, I believe, yes? Yeah. Um, so Thank I was um, interested <laughs> mostly in the discussion that you had earlier about exhibition spaces and the way that um, it can either be harmonious or disharmonious. Um, also, um, given that you've exhibited in both museums and galleries, which are secular spaces, and cathedrals, which are religious, um, I wonder if you have any observations about the differences between the power that your works of art have in each of these spaces to affect the viewer um, when your work really kind of weaves together kind of prayer and art. Um, mm. Well, um, I mean, I'm reminded of something Peter Sellers, the great theater director, one of the great theater directors of our time, who's a personal friend of Kieran Mines, um, said one time when we were, uh, he was working on the exhibition at the uh, Whitney Museum that we did in, in uh, geez, when, when was that, 1997 or something, 98 maybe. Um, and uh, we were looking at these spaces and we were thinking how to construct all the, uh, a show that basically exists from all of these video projections and monitors and things uh, and sound is bouncing back and forth and everything. So we're going through it and, uh, and um, Peter just said something that was just so beautiful as he often does. He said, you know, he said, when you walk into an art museum and you see these beautiful polished wooden floors and you see those pristine white walls, the only conclusion one can draw is that this must be a hospital and the works must be ill. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever said that about museums before. You know, and in a way he's right. They're just different spaces. I mean, they're just places that, you know, a mosque, uh, a Buddhist temple, a Christian church, these are just spaces. And it's what you bring into those spaces and what you take from those spaces that really makes the experience. It's rather we should pay a little less attention to the, uh, the architecture and the style and the culture that's behind them and more to say, we look, we're being given these beautiful empty spaces and you know I've shown my work in warehouses I've showed them at the Museum of Modern Art you know um, and I have shown them in churches as you know and uh, and in in Alhambra you know <coughs> in in Granada and it just is such a beautiful thing to see the consistency remains the work has a similar effect in different places but then it's absorbing these influences from around us you know you close yourself off in a little box which is, for me, the image of the, the television set in society. It's the box that kept everybody at home, you know? Why, why aren't you just, you know, in India, they look at TV like in groups, you know? <laughs> like, you know, hundreds of people watch programs together in the town square. So uh, it, it's closing yourself in a box, that's the danger. That's the danger point, you know? And you have to open that out so you can keep the dialogue going between yourself and a work which again, like I said, are marks from the past, human present, and also between the self and your culture and the people around you. you know? That's what we need today, we need cultural understanding and art is the only universal <coughs> language we have. It's a, the true human universal language from that mark on the cave wall right up through the Museum of Modern Art today. That's, that's the human thread. You'll be hard pressed to find a white wall here in this museum. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. I, I should point out, of course, Bill knows this, that uh, Peter Sellers um, is uh, the last conversation about nothing in this series on the, uh, I think, the 29th of January, um, <coughs> and he'll be sitting uh, together with uh, the economist Raj Patel, and they'll be talking about the economics of nothing and how divesting yourself <laughs> um, of material possessions is actually a freeing experience. Um, so great. I suggest you all come to that one. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got time for just a few more questions, and I see a hand sort of fairly far in the back. Keep your hand up, ma'am. Anybody else while we're about it? And all right, the first row. So um, why don't you start first, because you've got the mic. Yeah. And then we'll come I, to wanted you to ask, I wanted to ask Mr. Viola about your spark or your passion for your art making. Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? From whence does it come? And is it out of nothing? <laughs> is it, I mean, is it a time when you're thinking of nothing that the spark comes or reading or meditating? How do you do it? Um, I think 
uh, I have, I see, since I've been very young, I see things in my mind. I've always been able to do that. Um, and uh, on the very first day of kindergarten, a teacher put a finger painting in front of all of us students at PS20 here in Queens. And uh, I made a tornado and the teacher was going around behind of all of us on the desk on the first day and, and she saw my tornado and she held it up to the class and I dove under the table. <laughs> and, and then uh, Mrs. Fell was her name, she put it on the wall and that was my first exhibition and pretty much, <laughs> pretty much I was the class artist for most of my life. So I, it wasn't, I think the task that one has in those situations is it's not that if you have whatever streams in your mind, our friend Esoteka Solomon, who conducted the LA Phil Show a couple of years ago, uh, hears music in his mind constantly from when he was little, you know, so some people just have that. We all have something that we're connected with. Um, but then, then the really, the job becomes um, discernment, you know, of what these things are, because the stream of the images is just coming, the sounds are just coming. Then you have to really kind of think what they are and um, you have to be open and free when necessary and you have to be very controlled and tight when necessary. You know, creativity can arise just as easily out of boredom as it can out of pressure. <laughs> and, and, you know, those are the two sparks that spark the cre creative thinking and feeling. So that, that's, um, I can't say where the, they, they come from. I only know that I'm the one that can um, bring them in the world into the world along with the help of my wife and partner Kira who's my kind of midwife that lets me know y this thing is going to be born now you got to do this and I'll do it um, but uh, as far as what where they're going you know a Zen teacher said a couple of things really profound to us we, we had a we studied with a, a Zen master named Diane Tanaka in Japan when he lived in Japan for a year and a half from 1980 81 and uh, he, he was just so um, extraordinary. He, you know, I, I remember uh, one of the first times I was trying to show him my work and seeing what he thought about it and I was pulling these things out and I was explaining all the pictures and finally he couldn't stand it anymore and he looked me right in the eye and he took his hand and he slapped my head, bang! And I was like totally shocked. And then and I said, what? He said, no thinking. <laughs> Too much thinking, <laughs> you know? And that really, that really stayed with me. That, that kind of idea. The other thing he said to me one day was, he said, uh, and I was, we were t we, somehow we were talking about masterpieces, and he said, you know, he said, you, it's okay to talk about that. I was explaining to him some of the Western artists that I liked, and he said, but you must learn how to work from a position of weakness. And no art professor ever told me that. And that's, that's really what it's about. You know, I mean, masterpieces teach you nothing. Okay, Hit Hillary on Everest with the flag, that's a kind of, ma you know, that's what a masterpiece is. It's over. You cli it's kind of mountain, finished. Like, what I want to know and what I need to do is I need to know what shoes did he wear, what crampons did he use, why did he go up on the north face or the south face? You know, it's so beautiful in, in when you're in the act of something, then everything's moving and flowing. But once it's over and you come down from the mountain and you go into the lodge, and you get your beer and you sit and you say, wow, I just climbed a mountain, then you have a story to tell, but it's over. So the idea is never let it be over. You gotta always, there's always something in there that's missing that you didn't think about and it'll catch up with you. Sometimes years later I get to realize what I should have done and maybe what I was in the middle of and I haven't finished. Very important. Um. Uh, you know, Rinpoche is just coming out with a new book called Rebel Buddha on the Road to Freedom, uh, which I'll be happy to sign for you afterwards if you'd like. Um, but I was wondering, what are you trying to tell us in this book? What story are you trying to tell us through <laughs> this work? I mean, I haven't read it yet, so, so it's just, it's, it's hot off the press today. So um, can you just give us a, an indication of, of what you're trying to tell us here? Do we have enough time? <laughs> Well, you've got um, all day tomorrow, I understand, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. yes, I am. Um, well, it's, uh, you know, this book was developed from my, uh, some discussions 
with my friends in Boulder, Colorado, my students and friends there, and then in Seattle. It's uh, you know basically about uh, what is uh, um, Buddhism, you know, without culture, and what is culture, you know, and that's our challenge here. Um, Buddha's uh, teaching or his words of wisdom. It's uh, so much wrapped up in different cultural forms of, uh, let's say, so far from Asia. And so when we're trying to uh, study this wisdom or practice this wisdom, we always face challenges in terms of our cultural ties between the East and West, mm -hmm. or even within the East, you know, from culture to culture, or country to country. And so here, you know, I was trying to explain about uh, what is the culture and what is Buddhism, and w uh, what is the teachings of the Buddha, <coughs> the wisdom uh, and compassion, as we always talk about. Mm -hmm. And uh, then basically talking about American culture and uh, uh, American Buddhism. I would suggest it's worth getting, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, <laughs> we will take one last question. I think the mic's already in the house. Who's got the mic? Someone in the back. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I thought it was a happy accident that um, I went to the Pace Gallery before coming here and seeing those Sujimoto photos where he literally was capturing the spark. I was wondering if you had seen that exhibit and what you thought of it. No, I didn't see that exhibit. Okay. And no. I was just uh, to follow along with that, whether the, what other artists. I can't see you. Where uh, are you? Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <coughs> what other artists, um, you know, move you? Oh, gosh, there's so many. I mean, they come from all times and places, and um, I mean, I can't, I can't really say, and I don't, I don't find it all that useful to, to have to really talk too much about my own list of greatest hits. I think when you go to museums, when you go to galleries, um, these are openings. They're um, they're, they're times when you're not in your normal mode, unless you work in the gallery, but you know, you're not, this is a, something outside of your job, outside of even sometimes your family. And, and the whole point is to open yourself up so that um, you will make a guarantee if you have an open mind and open heart um, and don't read the wall labels, please. You know, they'll just tell you the dates and who did it and what time and blah, 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 blah. You know, you have to make, you have to find you in those things. Our, we do our work for you, you know. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing, you know, line of sight. You know, Michelangelo's David, you know. So it's waiting to catch you when you read, move through the museum. And the way you respond to it is by being into so that you can receive it. You go in with this big brochure thing and you've read all this stuff. Oh, yeah, all you're doing is just confirming what some art historian or curator told you, wrote about in the, in the catalog set. But if you go through it just with everything as, as much as possible o with openness, you'll find yourself in it and it will reflect you and it might um, disagree with you. It's not all g doing it you know, really good. Um, uh, the great Sufi master, Ibn al-Arabi, is one of my all-time heroes. Um, he, he's written beautiful things. He said, the self is an ocean without a shore. It has no beginning or no end in this world and the next. So that's about as open as it gets. The other thing he talked about was a concept that he called, he dubbed uh, al-Hayra. And al-Hayra is translated in different ways in English. And the one translation I have that I love is al -Hayra constant circular rotation around the point mentally incomprehended. <laughs> now, <laughs> guess what? Even just by saying it, I just in inadvertently moved my hand, okay? It's moving, Dharma wheels, you know? See, these guys have it right. Um, it's got to keep moving, <laughs> you know? And, 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 you know, I always put on, you know, I put on a CD or a DVD and I always think, wow, little Dharma wheels spinning away, look at that, um, you know? Um, so there, it's that movement that's going, especially when, when there's some mystery or lack of comprehension in something. That'll just pull you right in. And that's, 
that's how you make your list of masterpieces. You don't have to show it to anybody, or you can tell your friends. 